Uh, again, we're delighted to have you with us. Uh, we're very excited, actually, to have the Deputy Secretary and the Undersecretary for Acquisition to, with us today. Um, let me say, first of all, that Dr. Hamry and Dave Berteau both apologize for not being here. They were have unavoidably detained for a, a variety of reasons, which are uh, unfortunately turned out to be more important. Um, we're, we're thrilled to be able to continue the open dialogue today between the department and industry and the public on this Better Buying Power initiative that, that the department has been leading to improve the efficiency of the acquisition system. Always important, but more important than ever in the budget times that we're facing. Uh, the format we're going to use this, this today is the Deputy Secretary is going to have a few remarks and then we'll introduce <laughs> the Under Secretary. And then when uh, the Under Secretary comes up, he will make a presentation. Then we'll have questions. What we'd like to do is for the questions, the format will be we'd like you to write your questions down. There are people in the room. If you just hold up your hand, they'll give you a card to write your questions down. They'll bring them forward to John Etherton and I, and then we'll answer those questions unless it seems appropriate to do it otherwise. Um, let me just say the norm. If you have a cell phone on, please make sure it's off, anything that makes noise. Um, and then finally, Dr. Carter, we're delighted to have you with us. You don't need an introduction to this crowd. They know you enormously well. Uh, we appreciate the efforts you're making at DOD and all, all the difficult decisions that you're facing. Uh, the country's better off to have you uh, leading us. So thank you very much, and we appreciate you being with us today. Th thanks, Kim, uh, for that introduction, for uh, the opportunity to be in this great organization and, and forum, uh, for everything you do for the Department of Defense uh, at, and have done over years for national defense. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, to Dave Berteau, I know he's not here, but to him and his family, we wish you strength and send you our condolences. Uh, this is uh, 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 really uh, uh, an initiative to, that is to the credit of Frank Kendall. Uh, it's his show, and I'm just the warm-up act here. Um, but I'll give you a little background on, on this. First of all, I'm delighted to see all my colleagues from the acquisition uh, community uh, here, good, good friends and very skilled uh, people. Uh, let me take you back. It was two years ago uh, at the Eisenhower Library that then Secretary of Defense Gates uh, spoke uh, presciently, it turns out, about the days of uh, ever-increasing defense budgets uh, soon coming to an end as our uh, elected leaders grappled with our fiscal circumstances. What he said at the time famously was, the gusher has been turned off and will stay off for a good period of time. And, and in acknowledgement of that coming fiscal reality, and in an effort to minimize the impact of it, Secretary Gates launched a, an initiative across the department to ensure that the department would not be forced to sacrifice where, wherever possible an ounce more force structure than was necessary. Better buying power, which was now we have to call it better, pi, bar, better buying power 1.0, uh, was, which was introduced in September uh, 2010 by me and my partner, Frank Kendall, was the acquisition system's contribution to this overall initiative. And it was directed at the approximately $400 billion a year that the department spends in the acquisition of goods and services. Better buying power's goal was, as we said then, more capability for the warfighter and more value for the taxpayer by obtaining greater efficiency and productivity in defense spending, what economists call productivity growth. To achieve these objectives, we directed 23 principal actions in five major areas. First, to target affordability and cost growth in our programs. Second, to incentivize productivity and innovation in, in, in industry through profit and partnership. 
Third, to promote real competition wherever we could. Fourth, to improve our trade craft in the acquisition of services as opposed to goods. And fifth, to reduce non-productive processes and bureaucracy in the government as well as in industry. And I won't go over each of these, these areas, it's, but it's worth noting that over the past two and a half years, uh, we've worked hard and with some considerable success in some major programs to implement these uh, directives. And we, but at the same time, though, we acknowledged at the time we released Better Buying Power 1.0 that we wouldn't get everything right, that we weren't hadn't captured every good idea that was out there, that we knew that in some cases the data sets upon which we were basing decisions were still incomplete, and we knew that we would need to adjust based on uh, initial implementation experience. We also knew that industry would continue to come to the table with good ideas and constructive criticism. Uh, and in this regard, let me address a few industry concerns that I share, and I think our leadership shares, uh, that we've learned up front. Uh, the first, uh, I recognize that industry needs profits and margins to be successful. While incentivizing cost consciousness will continue to be centrally important to our work, we need to do also to pay more attention and be attentive to best total value and program risk so that transactions are successful for both parties. Uh, second, I share industry's concerns about an excessive oversight culture. I've long been concerned that the number of approachers was, uh, was uh, I'm sorry, that the number of watchers was approaching the number of doers in the department. You have the doers in front of you here. And we may in fact be reaching that threshold, uh, especially with respect to things like audits and uh, we're trying to work internally and work with industry to address these issues. Uh, and third, we've listened to and are addressing industry concerns about contracting practices and so forth, where it's possible for us to, to do that. Um, <clears throat> more broadly, a notable feature of Better Buying Power 2.0, as Frank will explain in more, more detail, is improving the professionalism of the total acquisition workforce, which encompasses program management, engineering, contracting and product support disciplines. Uh, we know that the quality of our people is an essential ingredient to our success as an acquisition enterprise. As we continue to implement better buying power, we look forward to working with our industry partners and our acquisition workforce to do more and more each and every year to get more value for the taxpayer and the warfighter. In fact, that's what Better Buying Power 2.0 is all about, just like Better Buying 1.0. And I salute Frank, who was my partner then and is now the leader of this effort, and his team, which is here, for their, their excellent work. Now, achieving Better Buying Power would, of course, be an important goal in any budget environment, but its importance has only grown given the strategic and budgetary challenges we now face. Since Better Buying Power was first unveiled, Congress passed the Budget Control Act, which required the department to cut $487 billion from our defense plans over 10 years. A year and a half ago, we did that, first by devising a new defense strategy to guide us as we turn a strategic corner from the post-9-11 era dominated by the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan to an era defined by new challenges and new opportunities. While the budget that we derive from our new strategy absorbed significant reductions in defense spending, it made important strategy-driven investments in the Asia-Pacific region, where so much of our future economic and political interests lie, in special operations forces, in future-focused domains such as cyber and space, in countering weapons of mass destruction, and in certain areas of our science and technology portfolio, including electronic warfare, and command and control. It's still true today, as it was then, that every dollar not wasted is a dollar that can be invested in these new capabilities. 
At the same time, as we have made reductions to our base budget spending plans, our overseas contingency operations funding, which is not included in the base budget, and which is largely for Iraq and Afghanistan, is also decreasing. Taken together, these reductions in base and OCO compare in pace and magnitude to historical cycles <clears throat> excuse me, in defense spending the nation has experienced in the past, either after Vietnam or after the Cold War. However, as this audience well knows, due to the collateral damage of political gridlock here in Washington, we are now also operating under sequestration, which requires us to subtract an additional $37 billion from our budget for the remainder of fiscal year 2013. Sequester presumes that we take equal or proportionate shares from each and every part of the budget, which is the worst managerial approach possible. Sequester is not only regrettable in its own right, but it distracts from the true strategic and managerial tasks before us. Secretary Hagel and I and the entire leadership of the department are doing everything we possibly can under this deliberately restrictive law to mitigate its harmful effects on national security. But as the Joint Chiefs have emphasized repeatedly, the impacts on our readiness are real and in many cases irreversible. Now, while the sequester for FY13 ends October 1st, there's no way to know what's for sure what's next here in Washington. Virtually no one believed that sequester, what, sequestration would actually go into effect in the first place. Now, we in DOD can adjust and adapt to a wide range of contingencies, but this will be easiest if we have stability, time, and flexibility. The President has submitted a budget that meets these goals as part of a balanced deficit reduction plan. For defense, it contains $150 billion more in 10-year cuts compared to last year's plan, in addition to the $487 billion reflected in the Department of Defense's fiscal year 2013 budget. Most of these cuts occur beyond 2018, which gives us time to plan and adjust. And while no agency wants to cut its budget, the President's plan is much more practical than the cuts that could occur under persistent sequestration. Cuts that could amount to $52 billion in FY14 alone and could cost $500 billion over 10 years. We urgently need Congress to grant us stability, time, and flexibility. The House Budget Resolution, the Senate Budget Resolution, and of course the Budget Control Act actually have a wide range of future scenarios for our budget, not the stability we seek. For this reason, in March, Secretary, asked me, Secretary Hagel asked me, working with Chairman Dempsey, to conduct a strategic choices and management review to examine the choices that underlie our defense strategy, posture, and investments, including all past assumptions and systems. The review will define the major choices and institutional challenges affecting the defense posture in the decade ahead that must be made to preserve and adapt our defense strategy and the department's management under a wide range of future circumstances that could result from a comprehensive deficit reduction deal or the persistence of the cuts that began with this year's sequester. Everything's on the table, roles and missions, war planning, business practices, force structure, personnel and compensation, acquisition and modernization investment, how we operate, how we measure and maintain readiness. We plan to complete our work and tee up decision points and recommendations to Secretary Hagel and the President and the President in the coming weeks and months. The choices that are made will inform how we execute our FY2014 budget, our FY2015 budget submission, and will serve as the foundation for the Quadrennial Defense Review due to Congress next February. And I hope that one of the principal benefits of the review for our, our acquisition programs and correspondingly for industry will be to bound the uncertainty that we currently face. Uncertainty is anathema to good management. In our, in, for us, 
and also for our partners in industry. It discourages investment. It causes the hoarding of capital, prevents the national, natural rationalization of our industrial base, and it harms growth. I should also mention that in conducting our review, we have been very mindful of how the choices we are considering will affect industry, which is the uh, basis of the CSIS forum we speak to today. As I've said many times before, the success of our better buying power efforts and the defense enterprise, for that matter, is clearly dependent on having a healthy, robust, and vibrant industrial base, as dependent upon that as it is getting best and uh, superior uh, value for the taxpayer's dollar and for the warfighter. Let me close again by congratulating Frank the entire acquisition team that has worked so hard for the taxpayer and for the warfighter does it every day and so hard on this important effort. Frank, especially to you, my friend, uh, my partner uh, for a long time, has done a tremendous job of implementing Better Buying Power 1.0 and a fantastic job of moving beyond that to an improved version of better buying power, which he'll outline today. Frank and the rest of the team here, you've made a tremendous difference. Thank you. Come on up, Frank. I want to thank Secretary Carter. It's uh, terrific to have a boss who really understands what you're doing and supports you as much as he does. And it's, it was a great partnership. Uh, I miss it. But I'm carrying on the work, as you can see. And thank you for your support. I want to thank CSIS for uh, hosting this afternoon. Thank Kim Winkup for emceeing. Uh, beyond that, I, of course, want to thank my team, uh, people who made this possible today and did all the work that went into this, starting with Katrina McFarland and Jim Townsend, who carried on their work from better buying power, or what we're now calling 1.0, uh, into 2.0 and putting all, all of this together for me. Service acquisition, acquisition executives represented by Heidi Shue from the Army, uh, major contributors to this, OSD staff people. I'm not going to go through all the names. We've got a lot of you here today. Uh, and industry. Industry provided us with a lot of inputs for uh, this version of better buying power, this upgraded version, if you will. Uh, that, that dialogue continues. I just got a letter today from AIA with some additional things they'd like to talk about, and we're delighted to do that and carry on that dialogue. Uh, that conversation is going to continue. We learn a lot from industry, and a lot of industry's inputs are reflected in the things that are on this chart. I'm not going to walk through 34 bullet points with you. That would take more time than we have. Uh, I'm going to hit a few of the wave tops. But before I do that, I'd like to say a little bit about sort of this uh, initiative overall and how it fits into what we're doing. Someone asked me uh, not too long ago if I was a transformational or an evolutionary leader. And the answer I gave after thinking about it for a second was that I'm more evolutionary. Part of that is that I don't believe there are simple fixes. I don't believe that there's one or two policy changes we can make which are going to fix, if you will, defense acquisition. We're in a very, very complicated business. And we had 23 initiatives in Better Buying Power 1.0. There are about 34 here. There are another 100 things, at least, that we're working on that aren't on this chart. Uh, it's a very complicated business. It covers a wide range of products and services that we acquire and a number of organizations which all have their own cultures, technologies that are difficult, uh, cutting edge in many cases, uh, services that we need to produce more efficiently. It's a very, very big scope that we're trying to address here. And the way to improve it, I think, is not with one or two policy changes or even five or six. It's with continuous effort to understand the results that you're getting, why you're getting them, and where you can make improvements on the margin. And that's what this is all about. Another important feature of this is that sub bullet up at the top, a guide to help you think. When Dr. Carter and I put out 1.0 and went around the country talking to the workforce, one of the things we told them was that we really wanted them to think, that the guidelines we had put out in 1.0 were not hard rules written in uh, stone to be followed on every occasion. They had to be applied with judgment, and that's what the thinking part is about. The range of things that we do is so diverse uh, that each problem has to be approached and assessed on its own rights. That's a process that our people have to go through. That's one of the reasons there's a new category up here about professionalism in the workforce. That's not an easy job. It takes professionals 
and it's the key to success. Getting those little decisions right, getting the acquisition strategy right, really understanding the technology maturity in your program, really understanding what makes industry uh, perform better for you, what incentives work and which ones don't. And those are threaded all through this. So what you see in the, the guidance that I just put out implementing 2.0 is a combination of some general guidance and then some specific actions that people take. Many cases it's to provide more thorough and more complete guidance to people to help them through the process of deciding how to act actually implement this. There is a stronger emphasis on the, our workforce and government uh, in this set of initiatives than there was, I think, in 1.0. And we're moving towards a direction where we do much more to improve our workforce, to make it more capable of making the judgments that have to be made to be successful and to improve outcomes. So evolutionary, yes, but transformational over time. If we continue to make improvements on the margin, and that's what this is all about, we will transform our results. Now, I, I want to give Ash credit for this because I think we're seeing some things that uh, show some evidence of improvement. I don't want to make too much out of a couple of data points. We're sending our selective acquisition reports to the Congress today. First time in my memory, there are zero non-McCurdy breaches, neither critical or significant in that report. And I think that uh, we give credit to Dr. Carter, I think, in large part for the leadership that went into moving us in that direction and the whole team for continuing the things, all the, including industry, by the way. So there is some evidence that things are getting better. We're getting some complimentary reports from the GAO for the first time in my memory. But we have, <laughs> well, maybe not the first time. Uh, we're going in the right direction, but there's still a lot of room to do better. And that's what this is about, finding those things on the margin where we can do better. Let me walk through a few of the specifics. Affordable programs. Uh, Ash mentioned how much pressure we're under right now and the uncertainty that we're dealing with. There's, I think, is, there's always a lot of motivation in the department and outside the department to get as much into the budget as one can possibly put in and to be optimistic about our outcomes. And what affordability is about is trying to constrain those and be more realistic in our expectations. It's about not starting programs that we can't afford. So that's, that's, that was part of 1.0. It was an important part of 1.0. I put it into a separate major bullet here. Uh, the difficulty I'm going to have right now, after we've been doing this for about two and a half years now, is to enforce these caps. So we're putting affordability caps on our programs, the idea being to force the requirements community to sit down with the acquisition community and do trade-offs between cost and capability. And where they have to, to get down to a cost that we can afford, reduce the requirement to stay within that level. Uh, that's easy to start out to do. It's hard to finish. It's hard to get to the end when people have to give up things that they want. But that's what we're going to have to do if we're going to recapitalize and modernize the force structure that we have. That's what that first one is all about. Controlling costs throughout the life cycle. One of the things that we've tried to do, and this shows up later on in the list, is to change our culture a little bit within the Defense Department so that cost becomes a much greater factor in how we do business and how we think about our jobs. I saw a Defense Business Board report the other day that talked about the Defense Department being different than the commercial world in this regard. In the rest of the world, and I've been in industry, I know what it's like to be out there, people worry about cost a lot. They try to drive cost out all the time. In the defense world, you get an amount of money, and then your job is to spend that money. It's a very different way to think about what you're, what you're trying to do. One of the key initiatives up here, and I think it's really caught fire, was in 1.0, is the idea of should cost that our managers need to go out and assec, accept, uh, understand their costs thoroughly, look at all the elements of costs that they're dealing with, and determine where they can make reductions in those costs, set targets for themselves, and then manage to that. Manage to the cost and try to reduce the cost, as opposed to just spending the money and feeling that that's your fundamental mission. And that goes across almost all of the things that we do. And I think we've made a lot of progress in that, but we're going to reinforce that and continue to do that. Uh, strong partnership with the requirements community, uh, another one I'll mention. Uh, working very closely with the Vice uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the JROC on this, that has to happen throughout the services as well. And a lot of these are like that. There's a top-level piece of this, uh, which involves myself and my staff and some of the senior leadership of the department, but a great deal of this goes down through the entirety of the many layers that we have in the department, and that's one of them. That has to happen for all ACAT programs. It has to happen for things beyond products as well. I want to turn to uh, productivity, innovation, and industry and government. Mention a couple of things there. One of the things that Dr. Carter and I put out in 1.0 was the idea of using more fixed price incentive fee contracts. That was a good initiative. But uh, my feeling, and I think Ash would agree with this, is that there was a bit of an overreaction to that. People started thinking that was what they should use all the time and use it for everything. So the guidance here modifies that a little bit. It says use the right type of contract for the job. We have a range of contracts for a good reason. You know, one place in particular, though, and it's still up there, where we want to use fixed price incentive more is in early production. 
It turns out that we're pretty good at predicting the cost of production. We're not nearly as good as that at predicting the cost of development. So there the risk is inherently higher. Uh, it may not be as appropriate to use a fixed price vehicle. But in early production, it makes a lot of sense. If we're going to overrun by, on the average, something less than 10 percent, that's well within the window we can cover with a fixed price incentive fee contract. And that's what we're doing. We've been doing a lot of that. I think it's paying off for us. Uh, we've moved in programs like, say, the F-35 when, when Ash was leading acquisition in that direction. And I think it's done a lot to get that program's cost under control. Um, best value. One of the things that I've been working with on the services is the idea of defining value. As we go out with a solicitation, let industry know what we're willing to pay for increased performance. Now, I had an experience many years ago where I was trying to sell a product to the government, to the Air Force, which we were absolutely certain was a superior design to our competitors. Would give much, much better warfighting performance. And I could not find a way to get my customer to put any credit in the source selection for that value. And, it, and we didn't obviously win the competition because of that, because we were more expensive. We had an inherently more expensive design. So when we establish threshold requirements and objective requirements, there's no point in putting down the objective requirement unless you're willing to pay a little bit more for it. If all you're willing to pay for is that threshold, then that's all you should ask for. So what I've worked with the services on is the idea of defining value. This is an impetus to innovation. If industry knows what we're willing to pay for higher performance, then industry has a reason to go out and try to reach that performance and get it to us at a cost that we're willing to pay. So the idea of best value is to reinforce that and to make it clear to industry so industry can bid uh, and decide how they want to approach a particular product more intelligently. Uh, we've, one of the areas that we've gotten a lot of feedback from industry on is something called LPTA, lowest price technically acceptable. And after uh, moving in this direction, we've gotten a lot of feedback that suggests that there are places where this really is not the right vehicle. The problem is that there are some types of, uh, of services in particular where it's very difficult to write down an objective standard. The people reviewing proposals need some room to maneuver to determine value in a more subjective way. And in those cases, LPTA is probably not the right vehicle. And I'm talking in particular about certain types of professional services where expertise is really what you're after. Uh, and it's hard to assess that in a, in a purely objective way uh, and then go just to the lowest price. And what happens in those cases is we tend to default to the cheapest bidder independent of the quality of the bid. And that's not the outcome that we want. That is not best value for the government. So we're backing off a little bit from the use of LPTA in those cases. And again, people, this is another case where our people out there in the workforce have to use their judgment and decide what's the best way to proceed. Um, DCA audits is a longstanding concern of uh, industry. We're working closely with, and this is one that we had on 1.0 as well. We're making some progress. Uh, I'm a little concerned about as our budgets shrink and as we have to do things like furlough people, whether we'll be able to continue that progress at the same pace. But we're working closely with DCAA and Pat Fitzgerald, who's the leader there, has been very involved in Better Buying Power and this whole initiative works with us closely. So we're working to get the backlog out. Uh, a lot of benefits to everybody to do that. Also mentioned up here is the Superior Supplier Program, where we're going to start recognizing our better suppliers in industry. And one of the things we can do for, for our suppliers, uh, if they make a certain category, and show good results in their audits consistently, is to reduce the frequencies and the depth of the audits that we do, and tie that to their performance in that area. And we're working to, to initiate that. Uh, unproductive processes and bureaucracy, I, I, waging a continuing war against non-value-added activities. Uh, it's, it's a harder fight than you might imagine. Uh, in a letter I received from AIA with some ideas, they, they asked me about uh, an item that was in Better Buying Power 1.0 that didn't fit on the, on the PowerPoint here. When I put out the uh, initial guidance in November, I, I, I did a, a uh, what happened to the 1.0 initiatives. And that was one of the initiatives that I said we were continuing. It just didn't manage to fit, get it fit on the chart. But we will continue to work with industry to identify things that are non-value added uh, that we impose on industry that really don't provide any value. And AIA sent me a letter. I think the Board of Governors is actually watching this, so I'm, this is a shout out to them. Uh, we, I've got your letter and we're gonna react to that. We'll set up a team to work those things with you. Uh, but that, that item has not disappeared at all. Uh, a lot of this is about internal processes. I had a conversation with one of our program executive officers once who said that when he had a multi-year program, he was the most effective program manager he could possibly be compared to any other time in his career, because all he had to do was work on his program and work with his suppliers to get, uh, get more for the money for the taxpayers and for his warfighters. And I thought about that, and I took that to heart. The burden that we put on our people to come do things for oversight reasons, while it may not cost that much, and it may not delay programs that much, 
it takes managers away from something else that they really should be doing. So that's an important thing. We're going to start tracking this. We're going to start tracking how much time our people spend giving briefings to the staff and getting coordinations and going around doing the things that they need to do just to work their way through the process and then go attack the things that we can push back on. This will be a collaboration between the Secretary of Defense's office people and the service people because a lot of this bureaucracy exists in the military departments as much as it does in OSD. Uh, effective competition. A firm believer that competition is the most effective way to reduce cost. And we're continuing something we did, uh, same emphasis was in 1.0, we're gonna continue that. And we will uh, find creative ways. And the idea here, and what we want people to think about here, is creative ways to create competitive environments for industry. So that there is a reason for people to work harder to keep the business that they have. You know, Ash mentioned profits. Every speech we ever give on this, I think we talk about profits. We're not trying to take out profits to cut costs, but we do want to tie profits to performance. And this is an area where we can do that. And competition helps us drive down, uh, down costs as well. Uh, one, uh, I'll mention this because I think it's important and it gets back again to the professionalism of our workforce and the requirement to think. It's the assessment of technology readiness. We had a kind of a bureaucratic system that we put in place to assess the readiness of things to move to the next phase. And as I was reviewing programs, I had a program come in to me that was advertised as low risk because it had met a certain technology readiness level, had a label on it. And, that, and I was told that we had done competitive prototypes and therefore the risk in that program was low. So I asked the engineers to come in and go through the designs for me. And what I found out was that the demonstration part of the phase of the, of the pro program uh, had, had done competitive prototypes. It had a TRL assessment of TRL 6, which is kind of our standard. But that that design that was demonstrated was not the design that was going to be developed and produced. There was zero correlation almost between the two designs. And the light bulb went on that what was going on was that industry wasn't trying to reduce the risk. It was trying to get the contract. It was trying to win. And I had Bob Moore, who's a former deputy director of DARPA, a, uh, a colleague from the past, go out and look at about a dozen programs. And sure enough, this was happening fairly routinely. We were checking the box for a certain label that we put on things. And we were taking a process and doing something we had said was part of success in terms of reducing risk. We were not looking at the real risk in the product we were going to build. And industry was re responding as you would expect industry to. The motivation for industry is to, is to win the next contract and get the job. That's what comes first. I was in industry, and that's exactly the way I behaved, and that's what we should expect. So the message of that was that we have to understand more thoroughly. We have to require industry to actually reduce the risk in the product. So that, that's what that one's about. And like a lot of others here, this is about making sure our people understand thoroughly what it takes to ensure success as they manage their programs and their service contracts and so on. Okay, the next category up there is acquisition of services. This is almost lifted from the, uh, the, the Better Buying Power 1.0 without many changes. What we're doing here, though, is, is building on what Ash and I did in 1.0 and expanding our, our management of services. We're moving it beyond just the contracting side of this to the management of services. My deputy, uh, who couldn't be here today, is going to be the leader for the department in contracted services, Alan Estevez, uh, if I can ever get him confirmed. Um, Alan's going to take this on. There's going to be a senior manager in OSD, a senior, senior manager for each of the major categories of service contracting. And they're going to be working to identify with the services and the agencies best practices in each of the different areas of service contracting and implementing policies that go down to that level. And this includes things like information technology services, uh, facility services, maintenance services, and so on, knowledge-based services, uh, et cetera. There's some standard categories that each is a professional uh, area in its own right. Each has its own characteristics. So we're going to continue that process. I'm working on a draft uh, DODI that'll, that Dick Jimmon has been working on that'll cover services contracting that's going to go down that path and make those policies more clear. A lot to be done there. We spend more money on services than we do on products. And if there's a place where I think we can gain greater efficiencies in the department and make major inroads and savings, uh, and I can contribute them to what Ash is now leading for the secretary, that's the place I think we're going to be able to do it. Uh, professionalism of the acquisition workforce, I've alluded to that as I've gone through these. Uh, establishing high standards for our, our key leaders, program managers, uh, chief engineers, Ash mentioned the list generally. Uh, contracting people, of course, uh, logistic support, life cycle support people, and testers as well. These people that run uh, a, either a program or a major portion of a program or a multi-billion dollar service contract have huge responsibilities. They need to be qualified for that, that, that job. They need to be prepared for it. They need to develop the skill sets, get the education, get the training, get the experience. A lot of this is the right experience. 
We have a system in, within our workforce which is a little bit of a kind of a check the box system for Dawiya categories of, of, of uh, uh, hierarchy, if you will, of professional uh, levels, which doesn't go far enough. We need to strengthen that and we need to make sure that people who are, are labeled ready to take on one of these major key leadership positions truly are. It's not fair to them to put them into a position that they're not prepared to take on. Uh, cost consciousness, a cultural thing, I mentioned it earlier, I'm going to close with that. In the climate we're in today, there is nothing more important for us. Uh, getting, you know, I, I delayed ruling this out a little bit. I initially announced it in November. We worked for a few months on it. Uh, we went past the first of the year. It became pretty apparent we were headed for sequestration after that. It was a difficult time for the department. Uh, we're now into implementing sequestration. There's no reason to stop doing our job, and there's every reason in the world to do it better. Okay? We have less resources to work with now. Uh, the cuts that we're taking are hugely inefficient. Ash alluded to that. We, are, you know, we didn't have a, 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 a cyclone or a hurricane arrive the day sequestration was implemented. What happened was the rain started to fall, and it's still falling, and the water's rising, and that's what we're dealing with. I read the uh, weekly, we get a summary of the things we're doing because of sequestration. Uh, and if you lead that list, there's some things on there that you kind of shake your head and say, well, that's not seem, you know, if the, if the Blue Angels can't fly this weekend at the Naval Academy graduation, that's not the end of the world. But if I can't repair the runway, and I have an increased chance of FOD damage on the runway, if I can't buy any furniture to put into the building I just paid for, and therefore I have to stay in lease space longer, if I can't do the maintenance on my major end items, if my units aren't training, these things add up. And what we're essentially doing right now is taking a huge number of inefficient actions. All of our investment accounts uh, in production are coming down in terms of quantities to less economic quantities. All of our research and development accounts are being stretched out, less efficient production uh, or research and development profiles. Uh, we're carrying more overhead longer because of that, basically. The fixed costs go on longer. All of this is inefficient. All is the opposite of what I'm trying to accomplish here. And that's going on, and that water keeps rising. And if uh, Ash's scenario plays out, we're going to go into a very similar situation in FY14, which I think, I've used the word devastating before. I'm not going to back down from that. That's the sort of impact this is having on the department. In any event, uh, more pressure than ever on us to get as much value as possible for the money that we have. And that's what our workforce is dedicated to doing and will continue to do. And a big part of this is to ensure that they have the knowledge base and the tools and the, and the freedom to do what they need to do and they're empowered to do what they need to do. So thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to take a few questions. Um, I guess I'll start and other folks can uh, get their questions ready. The department has made a number of legislative proposals as part of their submission for the FY14 National Defense Authorization Act. Yesterday afternoon, uh, the uh, department posted on the um, Office of uh, uh, Legislative Affairs website the uh, proposals for limiting uh, executive compensation uh, on cost type contracts to $400,000, which is the president's current salary level. So essentially, what the department is proposing to do is limit uh, reimbursement for compensation at one level of compensation, or one element of compensation that's essentially set for an elected official in the political process. There are some folks that are concerned about the ability of the industry with that sort of limitation and the downward pressure on costs generally over time to be able to continue to attract the talent both on the technical side as well as the management side. Could you comment on that and how you see that in relationship to what you're trying to do in better buying power? No, this actually came from the Department of Defense. No, no, this this was. Yeah. In general, we have a you know a free market, a market that's uh, a competitive market that supports us. And industry has to compete for talent in that market. You know, they need engineering talent, they need management talent, et cetera, and they have to go out and compete with the commercial world. And I think if we're going to have high quality people 
in the defense industry, they need to be competitive. So I'm going to have to take a look at that and see where we are. Uh, Maybe a result of an attempt to compromise with a, a more stringent restriction that Congress was going to put on that I was aware of, or at least was discussed in Congress at one point. Questions about the British idea, a concept that they're considering about changing their acquisition approach to a government operated or a government owned contractor operated. The questions revolve around how that's going to interface with the U.S. on existing programs that the U.S. and U.K. are involved in, how FMS will work, and generally, how, what do you see it? Think about it. Yeah, I've been aware of this for some time. Uh, Bernard Gray is the, my counterpart in the U.K., and he and I have been discussing this for about three years now, ever, ever since I met him. Uh, he, he has a Slightly different situation and a different, well, he has a similar situation in some ways, but I think it may be more severe, and he has a different solution to the problem. Uh, he's concerned about his organic capability to manage programs and how that is atrophied in the UK. Uh, management talent, technical talent, and so on. And his solution to that, and it's more quantity than it is uh, of people who ha- he has to do the things he needs to do. So his solution to that, that, which has been proposed, there's not been a decision yet in the UK on this, is to hire uh, someone to help him with that job. Bring in a commercial entity of some type. Uh, may look a little bit more at the end like an FFRDC than an actual you know, normal business. But in any event, he wants to basically hire management talent to help him manage his defense programs, which puts contractor people essentially in a role that traditionally might have been filled by government people. So we're gonna have to work through how that happens. I'm very aware of this. Uh, I suggested to Bernard about a year ago, several months ago, that we put together a joint team to go try to figure out what problems would arise because of this. Because there are certain things that need to be government to government and identify those. So that team's been working for a while. Um, I do not think at the end of the day that this will be a major impediment for us. It's just a problem we're gonna have to go figure out how to solve. And there are certain rules where I think the UK is gonna need to put government people in uh, to do it, to do make certain types of uh, arrangements in cooperation with the United States, for example, where it needs to be government to government, and we don't want it to be government to contractor. Um, but that's a work in progress. I uh, we're not having any disagreement about this or his path. The path I've chosen is to try to strengthen our existing workforce. I think we have a lot of talent in our workforce, but I want to build on that and make it stronger. Uh, People at the end of the day and leadership, just as in an operational unit, are more important than anything else for success. All these policies are nice, but people are what really makes a difference. And so I'm taking a slightly different path than he is. Uh, He has a reason to go in the direction he's going in. He's thought about it very carefully. We're going to work together to make it work is the bottom line. Mr. Secretary, you mentioned that uh, um, LPTA has been a very controversial issue and you've heard a lot from industry about it. Um, Do you have any comments as to um, how you intend to deploy uh, the approach the department tends to take uh, on LPTA contracts as you further clarify what uh, technically acceptable means, how that will get out to the field, and and what process uh, folks will understand what the policy is? We're writing some additional guidance for people. There's some general guidance in the implementing memorandum, but. Um, Many jobs are suitably LPTA. If I want somebody to cut my grass, for example, I can specify what that means in a fairly objective way and I can hold someone responsible for that when they do it. I just want the cheapest firm that's going to cut the grass to my specification. But if I want specialized advice in a very specific area, what I really care about is the talent that is offered to me and I have to uh, judge that somewhat subjectively in a source selection. So for different types of work, it's easier. The guidance of the workforce is don't use LPTA if you can't define an objective standard to measure successful performance. It's too hard to implement that. It, the concern comes out of a lot of people who are out there and feel that they have built up expertise in a certain area and don't know how to get credit for that in a source selection. I think there's some merit to that argument for some types of work, and that's why we're changing the guidance. Partners seem to have a number of questions of you. Um, and the one in particular is, what's your view on the role non-U.S. defense companies could have in reducing costs, promoting innovation, and providing DOD access to mature, ready-to-use technology? Do you have any general guidance that you're outlining or you're indicating in this regard? And, and there was sort of a further refinement of that. Given all that, explain how cutting the foreign cooperative testing program uh, makes sense. Uh, on the latter subject, the cooperative test program, we're in a situation where uh, we're not cutting anything that we don't want. We're cutting things we do want. Uh, it's just which things that we, you know, what's the least bad thing to do. 
uh, it's a, that's a good program. It's an important program. But as we look at all the other things we had to do uh, in past budgets, it had to come down a little bit. Uh, I, I very much believe in competition. That includes allowing uh, our partners to have uh, foreign firms that are from our partners to bid for things. We do fair competitions here. And we're open to sources from, uh, often in partnership with U.S. firms, but we're open to bids from, from our partners, particularly our closest partners, and we'll assess them fairly and objectively. And I, it, we have some cases in point where uh, people have reacted to the appearance of things I'm thinking about the tanker competition right now. But we have other cases where, uh, you know, I'm thinking now about the light attack competition the Air Force did recently, where it's quite clear that we're willing to go with foreign suppliers. Uh, I like competition. And I think there is now a global marketplace out there. We don't have a monopoly on technology. Uh, we don't have a monopoly on good ideas. And we're open to competitors. We've had to, in an area that's related to that, we've had to make some of our source selections more open to other people and releasing information to other people in order to make that happen. And we've kind of pushed back on that. And this is an area, by the way, where industry needs to talk to us. Okay, If you see something that is re restricted in some way and you think that's inappropriate and you want to let us know about that, please do. Because uh, there are times when people do, do that more than they should, frankly. Hey, one of the, uh, uh, over time, a number of different rapid uh, reaction, rapid equipment programs and accounts have been set up and many of those have been proven to be f good sources of innovation and acquisition. How do you see those accounts being integrated into some of the things you want to do, especially on the affordability side in uh, Better Buying Power 2.0? Yeah, that leads into a fairly, a, a this is going to be a little longer discussion than the question would suggest. Um, I'm concerned about the health of the industrial base as we take uh, significant cuts. In particular, I'm concerned about our research and development base. And the way we're taking cuts in the department right now, because, largely because of the uncertainty, what Ash talked about this, but we, first of all, sequestration and the cuts associated with sequestration happen very quickly. There's no phase in of those cuts. It's boom, $50 billion. Uh, we took $40 billion this year. If we go into 14 and we're looking at sequestration in 14, which politically certainly looks possible, uh, it's a $50 billion hit. And, we, and we're sitting here not knowing. The uncer one of the reasons the uncertainty is such a problem for us is we don't know what force structure to design the park department around. We don't know what ultimate level of budget we, we expect to be at. Everything else that we do flows from force structure. You know, you have to have, once you have a force structure, then you need a certain level of money to keep it ready, to keep the people trained, to keep the equipment ready to be operating. Then you need a certain level of money to, to modernize that force structure and to recapitalize it as it wears out. So it all flows from the force structure. And when the department gets out of balance, when we have too much force structure for the other accounts to, to support, bad things start to happen. One of the bad things is uh, readiness crisis. I lived the readiness crisis of the 70s in Germany. I was in a unit that had no spare parts. And we were essentially non-operational for parts all the time. You can have a readiness crisis because of training, too. You can stop training. You know, we're doing too much of that right now. Uh, you can have a readiness crisis because you didn't invest in technology, or you can have a hollow force because you didn't invest in technology that you needed to stay technologically superior. So you have to have a balance. But the balance flows from an understanding of what your force structure is. So as we go into 13, through 13 and into 14, if we don't have a good feel for where we're going to end up, we're going to be tempted to hang on to force structure rather than let it go and then have to try to get it back later. Well, if you have to take $50 billion out and you can't, A, you can't get it out fast out of force structure because it takes a while to get the people out, and you want to hang out of the force structure anyway because you're not sure where you're going to end up, the place you're going to pay for that $50 billion tends to be the investment accounts. To a certain extent, readiness. You can only take so much out of readiness. We're still engaged in Afghanistan. So we get a disproportionate hit. And you see this in our FY14 submission, I think. You know, what happened is uh, under the Budget Control Act, actually it's in the 13th submission, R&D and, and production dropped pretty precipitously. Uh, production recovered to a large extent over the five years. R&D did not. So I'm worried about R&D and what's going to happen there. Uh, one of the things we can do is, is something that's kind of related to the rapid acquisition idea. It's the idea of rapid prototyping. Uh, it's a way to hedge against an uncertain future. But we're not going to be able to afford to do an awful lot of that. It's a way to protect the industrial base and do things. Now, it's going from our standard acquisition processes to something which is more like, say, the MRAP program, which I think is also implied in that. Uh, the MRAP program is a very interesting program. It, it, it shows how we can do things quickly of a certain type. 
the MRAP has essentially took a number of commercial components, mostly from trucks, essentially, and put them together into a new package that we could fill very quickly. And then once we, and we did a lot of them in a hurry. You know, that's a different job than a cutting edge new fighter or a cutting edge uh, new missile system, which is a very intricate, complicated design, which extends our capability. There is nothing technologically sophisticated, particularly about MRAPs, right? But if I'm going to stay ahead of a peer competitor out there or anybody out there who's challenging me, and there are people who are challenging us in military technology today, challenging us very effectively, I, I would add, we're going to have to go to designs that are complicated and take longer to do. Uh, we took, I've taken a hard look at whether or not, and I have a number of people looking at this from different perspectives, but if you look at the data on how long it takes us to do things, over the last 20 years, we've added about nine months to a year to our time in development. It's not as much as many people would think. There are exceptions uh, where some programs have taken a very long time. But on the average, we haven't added that much time. Now, it, that may be due to complexity. Uh, it may be due to other factors. That's something we're going to have to do some more work on to try to understand. And I would like to get the cycle time down. One of the things we're trying to do in 1.0 and carrying on and uh, still even, I don't remember if it's on the chart or not, I think it is, is to reduce cycle times uh, continuously. So we're looking for ways to do that. Uh, but we got to get a deeper understanding of what actually is causing those cycle times. Is it, you know, is it our processes, how we do milestone approvals and the documentation associated with that? Is it how long it takes to get a requirement approved? Is it the amount of testing we're doing? And so we're going to have to dig deeper uh, in order to get at that problem. Okay. It's a bit of a, it's a follow-on to what you were just talking about, but it talks more about the uh, using recent guidance that you've talked about, about a pilot program using a Skunk Works type approach to uh, Whatever elements you, you think is appropriate. Yeah, let me, let me comment on that. That's, uh, did that make the list? It did. I've got about 50 other things that aren't on the list that I'm doing. I'm not sure if everything's up there. Um, the idea of a skunk works is a, uh, there's a long history of this. It goes back, I think, to the 60s originally, and even before that, shortly after World War II. Uh, Kelly Johnson's a famous name in defense industry, if you look at the history of defense acquisition. And he was the first leader for Lockheed, the skunk works. The, the idea at it, in its essence is that you have very small professional teams on the government side and on the industry side. You have a fairly well-defined requirement uh, and you have people that work very closely together to go develop a product that meets that requirement. And that team is empowered. Uh, it works, uh, again, very closely with a set of rules by which they operate. Uh, and there's a fair amount of trust involved in the organization that does that. That's a little different than the way we do business today, right? Um, the idea is to try to do something like that. Now, if we're going to do that, and I'd like, I've asked each of the services to propose a, a program that they would like to take that kind of an approach with. And what I would do is relieve them of many of the formal documentation requirements with all the staffing that goes with that that we do today. And instead use uh, intense on-site reviews, by, first by the staff and then by myself and the SAEs, service acquisition executives for the milestone decision. So we simplify that process enormously, and we focus on the substance of what's being done. And we have people doing it who really do understand it. What I need as a criteria to have this kind of a program, first of all, is an assurance that both sides, the government and industry, will have a truly professional team, that the requirements are well-defined, uh, and that those teams will work together. So I want to be looking at resumes of people from both sides. I want people who really understand the work. The where, where you get trust in an arrangement like this is from that understanding. Because both sides really know what's the right thing to do. They know what needs to be done to get the product developed, tested, and fielded. So there's no, you know, nobody's worried about the other guy doing something that doesn't need to be done or no fooling around. It's, 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 it's uh, right into the nuts of the design, nuts and bolts of the design, and the process to test out the, and prove out the product. So I think this is an experiment worth trying. And if we can have some successes with it, uh, we may be able to broaden it. But it's related to that last major bullet there about improving the professionalism. If, if we have people who are just you know, doing a checklist, you know, I'm, and I, my earlier discussion about the TRL levels and having had competitive prototypes goes right at this. If I had had a Skunk Works-like quality team and a, and a government industry side, that would not have happened, okay? We would have had a test of the act, tests and, and demonstrations of technology that actually reduced the real risk on the program because both sides would have understood exactly what it took to do that. And that's what I have to have to make that work. It's also going to be a program that entails some risk and is probably in a cost plus environment because of the close interaction that's necessary between government and industry. If you have a fixed price environment, essentially the government has defined a specification, turned it over to industry, and let industry go ahead and, and do the best to do the job. It's simplifying it too much, but that's the basic idea. 
so that's the idea of the Skunk Works. Uh, I, th I think it's something to aspire to. I think it's worth the experiment. If we can have some successes, then people who are successful at it will get to do more of it. And I think, you know, in the end, it could be a very, very efficient way to do work. But it just depends upon those criteria that I talked about. The concerns that uh, many in the industry have had is, is how well the companies of the trade associations stay engaged with the process of implementing and deploying the results of the better buying power work that will be going on over in the department. Uh, some of the areas that uh, will be addressed in this new effort will uh, fall into areas that are already covered by the FAR, the DFARs, other areas you've already got existing guidance. And so I guess there's a general question. What can the industry look forward to in terms of uh, engagement or the opportunity to comment on proposals, whether it be through a public rulemaking process or some other method? Yeah, that will vary by the initiative. Most of these have some specific actions associated with them. So we'll, we'll continue the dialogue. Um, I interact with individual from industry constantly. Brett Lambert is here. Uh, he's my lead for industrial base uh, relations, basically. Or he's manufacturing industrial base policy. Has a very strong connection with industry. The service acquisition executives all do. We will organize some ways to have a more structured way to get at some of these. Some of them will be DFARS changes that will go out for comment. Uh, others will be documents that we'll give to industry to give a chance to comment on uh, as more, you know, general policy guidance as opposed to specific directives like a DFAR. So we'll continue to engage with industry. And uh, if industry has ideas about how to expand that and how to make it more effective, I'd be happy to hear them. Doctor, you mentioned the selected acquisition reports that you're sending over today with no non McCurdy breaches. Congratulations. Several people have asked the question about what metrics are you using to, to judge these various uh, initiatives that you have? That's a terrific question. Um, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I've been talking about this report I've been producing for about a year and a half now, and I think people are starting to be saying things about it. But, uh, one of the things that I felt coming back into government three years ago was that it was time we started measuring our own performance. And I've been working to uh, to put together a body of data. I have a sign outside my door that says, in God we trust, all of us must bring data. Uh, so that we can start to actually look in the mirror and see how we're doing. I, I, I used to ask the question at, uh, as I talked to different groups of acquisition people, uh, can anybody in the audience tell me how well we're doing today compared to how well we were doing five or 10 or 15 years ago? And nobody ever knew, knew the answer. I think it's time we started measuring. It's not, uh, if, if you don't know where you are, it's kind of hard to tell how to get to where you want to want to go. Uh, so we'll be looking at the obvious things first. Uh, we have the SARS and their basis for a lot of data on uh, original baselines and then where we ended up. We also have a lot of data from the federal procurement data system on contracts. And if we start out to do development of a certain program, how much money we end up adding by the time we get the contract completed and that sort of thing, and what kind of changes we do. Um, we're fine. I've, I've seen a couple of very good studies on past performance that have gone into excruciating detail on what actually happened in a program, often by going back and interviewing people who were there when decisions were made to try to understand why the decision was made, which is often a very big part of the equation. So we'll look at the top level metrics of cost and schedule performance relative to initial plan. Uh, that tells us how well we're executing our plans, essentially. It doesn't tell us what we should have done. Uh, we'll also look at policies and what effect policies have on results. And there's so many variables I mentioned earlier in the acquisition business that it's very hard to pull out and correlate specific things. And a good example is fixed price contracting. Uh, does fixed price contracting get you better results or not? Well, the answer is it depends. It depends on what phase of development you're in and what kind of work you're doing. Do some kinds of products in seem to inherently have poorer performance, poorer results? The answer is yes. C3I programs don't do very well, for example, compared to others. Do some of the services do better? Do some of the buying commands do better than others? And this isn't about pointing fingers at people or blaming people. It's about understanding what works so that others can emulate that and do it. So my long way to report, I've got a stack of data about what, Katrina, about that thick, that uh, I'm trying to get into a format that I like and get that out to everybody to look at and think about because it's going to be something that's going to be very thought-provoking. It doesn't tell you the answers. It, it tells you much more than you know right now about what's really happening. Uh, the next step in this, and this will be updated annually, uh, to, as we get more insights and we collect more data and become more, more knowledgeable of what really is affecting what, uh, we'll look at things like number of courtesies, you know, what's happening to number of courtesies over time, you know, cost and schedule uh, uh, and performance changes over programs. We'll look at whether we're passing operational tests or not. Uh, we'll look at how many programs did we start and then kill. 
You know, those are the sorts of things that are going to be in this. Uh, we start, to, you know, one of the reasons that first bullet up there on affordability is there is because we've started too many programs and then shot them, usually because we got far enough down the road that we figured out finally we couldn't afford them. You know, that's why now we're going back. So we're learning from our experience there. There are lots of other opportunities. Uh, we'll look at industry. We'll look at how some firm, are some firms consistently better at delivering products as they promise they will than others. Uh, and that'll, shed, that'll be of interest, I know, to industry to see how they're doing on that. So we're moving in the direction of trying to measure that. For each of these specific things, we haven't tried to come up with a specific one for each of these. Some of them probably lend themselves more to that than others, but it's something that's worthwhile for us to take a look at. Terry, what, uh, uh, as far as the, the, in the various initiatives, what thought is being given to incent greater participation by the commercial sector in uh, DOD acquisition as budgets draw down and, and we can take advantage of, of investments made in the market and through other sources? Uh, there are some sectors where commercial technology is moving very quickly. Um, and be, you know, one of the things we can do to make it easier for people to get in and into defense businesses uh, uh, by establishing open systems and open standards. That's mentioned up there. Uh, one of the areas where we're doing something like that is our tactical radios. Uh, we have had a long, troubled program for a long time called Jitters, Joint Tactical Radio Systems, which I spent the first couple of years I was back in the Pentagon working with, with Heidi uh, and, and with others to try to get those on track. And I think we've gotten to a point now where we recognize that for some of those products, industry had done some investing on its own, and it actually you know, come up with products that were competitive that would meet our requirements and that we ought to give people a chance to bid those products. So we're going to a more commercial-like acquisition strategy for some of those products. So where there are opportunities like that, we're very open to them. Uh, but commercial electronics, particularly in the RF uh, domain, is one area. Uh, in the information systems area in general, and a good example of that is a combat system on the Virginia, which is largely an open architecture using commercial products. So that's one of the ways we can bring competition, of course. It's also a way we can get much cheaper products, at least at, the, at that level. Maybe not, I'm not going to get a commercial fighter plane, but some of the things that I put in the fighter plane uh, may be commercial. This question has a judgment inherent in it, but I'm going to ask it the way it was posed because it does raise an interesting question. How do you optimize your industrial base when you have little or no control over the government depots? Over the government depots. Um, depots provide a lot of value to us, okay? And there's a reason to have some organic capability to do certain things, maintenance mostly and upgrades. Um, you know, it's a very sensitive political subject. Um, right now, with the situation we're in the department, we are looking at creative ways to try to save money and to have more competition. Uh, we're not allowed to have competition, I think, under the law between the depots and the commercial world at the moment. Um, I don't know that we're going to go so far as to try to take that one on politically. It's something we should think about. Uh, there's a very strong caucus, as you're well aware, that supports the depots, since anybody in the room, I think, is well aware. Uh, and we do need some capacity there. So the question is, what's the right balance? Um, I, I, I think we need to be sure that our depots are giving us value, uh, and we need to have competition where we can. But I'm not sure that we can uh, move very far away from the situation we have right now in terms of the balance. Terry, to what extent uh, are the Better Buying Power 2.0 initiatives and their expected outcomes or other acquisition initiatives that you might be looking at as follow-on um, uh, influencing or informing the uh, strategic choices and management review? Um, we are looking at seeing things in the, in the strategic choices and management review to improve efficiency. Uh, Ash and I worked together in a meeting just before we came over here looking at some of those. Um, you know, as the original Better Buying Power was part of, you know, Secretary Gage's efficient initiatives, this is a con continuation of that. Um, where we can identify savings, uh, we will. What I think will come out of this work, though, is a little different than that. Our average development program for an ACAT-1 program overruns by about 30 percent. Our average early production lots for most of our ACAT uh, major programs overrun by about 10 percent. That's not in our budget, okay? If we can just get to where that doesn't happen, Okay, uh, we can avoid a lot of problems we're going to have downstream. Our budget does not assume overruns in our programs. It's, that's a built-in problem for us if we don't address it. I don't expect to be perfect in development in particular, but I think we can do better in both of those areas. Um, 
on the services side, I think there are some things we can do on the services side to improve efficiency and drive down cost. We did put some assumptions about that into an earlier budgets. Uh, uh, Ash and I worked that together, and then I worked it after he moved up to the deputy's position. So we, we may be able to do some things in the IT area, for example, uh, where we can achieve some efficiencies. I, I don't think anyone should fool themselves that if we take $50 billion a year out of the future budgets, that there's a free lunch in there somewhere. We've, uh, we're, we're at the end of, I'm, I'm just back in government three years. I walked into the uh, Pentagon in March of 2010 after having been gone for about 15 years, and very shortly after that, Secretary Gates made the Abilene speech that Ash talked about. We, he and I sat down and said, you know, this is serious business. We've got a big part of this. Let's get to work. Uh, the Better Buying Power 1.0 uh, initiatives came out of that, uh, as did a whole host of things that were not part of, you know, Better Buying Power that the department did to improve efficiency. You know, we did some consolidations, closed some organizations. Uh, we went through another exercise when we took $50 billion a year out after the Budget Control Act was posted to try to get efficiencies. There's not a lot of fat left in the Defense Department budget, where there's easy places to cut. And I mentioned earlier that you know, we're not making choices of things, you know, which thing do we, would we like to have that's on the margin don't we want. We're not cutting anything uh, at this point in time. Uh, you know, we're, we're getting rid of, we're doing the least worst things. Okay, I'll put it that way. You know, that's the kind of choices we're having to make now. And uh, you mentioned foreign... Uh, earlier question on foreign comparative tests. Good program. I had a lot of good programs. I had a lot of things I'd like to invest in. We're more in the position of a, a business that has all these things we could do to build products and to make money and improve efficiency, but they all require upfront investments. You know, uh, a good example of that is BRAC. BRAC requires some upfront investment, and you know you get a good return on that. We put a BRAC proposal into our 14th submission. We put one in our 13th submission, and it got a very warm reception from the Congress. Um, we put it into our 14th submission, and the first time around, we didn't assume any savings and we didn't assume any costs. We just asked for the authority to do it. The second time around in 14, we did assume some savings, but we put in the cost to try to get those savings. If you look at the return on the first few rounds of BRAC, it was very high. Uh, the last round is not really representative of all of what can be done in BRAC, the 05 round, I guess. The rounds before that got a great return on investment, uh, but we need some cooperation from the Congress if we're going to go down that path. Uh, there are a few other areas like that, but we're not able to make some of those upfront investments to get reductions later on. We don't have the capital. We don't have access to the resources to do that. So it's, it's unfortunately a situation in which we can't make all the upfront investments that we could to save money, even some of the best ones. It's, it's, it's not a good situation for us to be in. Close to the end of the time that you're available. Um, so maybe we should end this or get close to ending it with one that has an accolade at least to start in the question. Uh, support your. I'm in favor of that, Kim. That's a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> well, agree and support your position on the LPTA. And then the points they would like to make is how are you getting the word out to your workforce that, that whoever this individual still sees it being used as the first choice in service acquisition, even being used in, even also being used in cost reimbursable contracts? Um, I have a major task, and my service acquisition executives have a major task, and Katrina and Jim and the rest of the team have a major task of communication. Yeah, I, uh, there's, there's, there's continuity from uh, 1.0 here, a lot of continuity. There's some change here. And there's a equal and uh, a recognized lesson, I think, from 1.0 was the importance of communication. And I'm going to be getting out and talking to the workforce. Uh, my key leaders are going to be getting out and talking to the workforce. We're going to be putting guidance out to people. We're going to be doing things at DAU, at the university, Defense Acquisition University, to train people. Um, partly because a lot of this is on giving people tools and guidance so that they can use their judgment. Communications is crucial. And the DOD, uh, just the acquisition part of DOD, is a vast enterprise. It's huge. It has all these different organizations, many, many layers as you go through the hierarchies. You know, I mentioned the, the PEO, PM, SAE chain up there, something we're emphasizing for the major programs. But most people aren't involved with those. Most people are working somewhere in one of the buying commands or maybe on an installation. They're contracting for some work. Uh, there are a lot of layers away from the senior leadership. And we really need to make sure we communicate at all levels. And anything like this that involves change, uh, clear communication is hugely important. And it just requires continuous reinforcement and tenacity to make people sure that people get the message. So it's a huge job to doing that. And we're well aware of that. And that's, you know, the follow-up is what matters here. It's not announcing these things or putting out the policy. It's the follow-up to get out to the people and make sure they really understand what you intend for them to do and how to do it. So it's a good, good, good one to end on.
very much for, first of all, just the dialogue, the, your willingness to conduct this dialogue. It's enormously beneficial. We appreciate your coming to CSIS to do it, and we thank you for what you're doing in your service to the government, and particularly in this, this is so important to the budget, uh, what you're doing. So thank you very much for being with us today, sir. Thank you, Kim. Thank you, everybody.